when I had kids 30 years ago, uh, the word attachment really was starting to surface. And it seemed like a pretty magical kind of a thing that happened between yes. usually a mother and a yes, child. Yes, absolutely. And if you did that right, your child would be inoculated for life. So that's really what we believed. And I'm not sure what attachment was. I'm not sure that I did it right. I was always worried that I didn't quite do it right, you know. So what do we know about attachment now? And how does attachment to a parent fit into what you're describing as a wounded world? Well, we all know what constitutes a wound, I think, with our loved ones when we don't see the invitation to exist in their presence, in their eyes. Now you can imagine a child who lives with that, with not having any confidence of the invitation to exist. They've been born uh, in this, but are they invited to exist in the mother's presence, in the father's presence, in the big brother's presence, and all of this? Is that invitation there? If it's not, it constitutes a wound. Now you just, you just continue that. If kids become attached to their peers, heaven help them. Because the more they matter, the more hurt they are by all the wounds they see, the lack of invitation, the conditions on that invitation. And so you can see very much how children you know, if children were raised in, in a village of attachment where they could look in their grandma's eyes, in their, in, in their parents' eyes, and see this, it was safe. They weren't getting hurt. There are many ways you get hurt, bumps and bruises, but at least psychologically there was a sense of safety. Uh, and, and now you just change the children being attached to their peers. And again, what we talk about in Hold On To Your Kids, it just ups, ups the ante. It's a wounding environment. In that environment, we should not be surprised to realize children are losing their empathy, their caring. And, and so we think that is something they haven't learned. But no, it, it's something that they've actually lost. The brain has its reasons. It needs to equip for a wounding environment. You, you, uh, uh, you can't to care is to set yourself up for disappointment. But it's, it's, a, it's a result of our, of our children losing their tender feelings. In some ways, you think that if they have been vulnerable themselves, they would appreciate and see vulnerability in others. And no, no, no. It, everybody's vulnerable. You're born vulnerable. You can't help you vulnerable. Vulnerary, the Latin word, to be wounded. So we're all woundable. That's just our nature as human beings, um, from conception till death. So it's not a question of whether you were vulnerable or not. It's a question of whether your vulnerability was respected or not, whether it was protected or not whether it was looked after or not. Because if you're wounded in your vulnerability, then one of the ways you'll respond is to actually shut down. And then you're not vulnerable, but you're also not compassionate. So, so the, the lack of compassion is always a, a repressed hurt, uh, a hurt in your vulnerability. I had a really funny incident that some of you may have heard, uh, I talked about it once before publicly, happened last summer, um, about in 2006, I wrote an article for the Global Mail on fervorization. And fervorization is a technique where you basically <laughs> deliberately don't pick up a child when they cry at night. Mm -hmm. The idea is that that way they'll learn to go back to sleep. If you don't pick them up, you know, after two or three nights of not pick them up, they'll sleep through the night, which is true, they will. And I used to advocate this as a physician, practice as a parent, and then at some point, um, and partially under Gordon's influence, I, I, I came to the conclusion that this is wrong, that actually what we're doing here is we're giving kids the wrong lesson, the wrong, wrong message. Mm. Not only that, we, we also learned a lot these days about brain development and, and that we know how these early experiences are actually programmed into the brain. So that if you don't pick up a kid crying at night, and by the way, 
this is the culture doing this. This is not even parents. Mm -hmm. This is the culture telling parents to do this. And this has been going on for a good 70 years now. Blessed Dr. Spock for all the for all the fact that he had a lot of good things to say. He actually talked about the tyranny of the baby who wants to be picked up at night. The tyranny of the baby. Get that phrase. You know? So the, and his idea was, you know, not, not to pick up kids. My mother-in-law, who's now 89, remembers just her heart being torn apart but the doctors had told her not to pick up that baby, wounding that baby's vulnerability. Anyway, so I wrote this article in 2006 of the Globe pointing out that, apart from other things, this kind of treatment of an infant will model in the child's uh, f uh, cortex a world that doesn't care. Well, for some reason, the article reappeared in the Globe's website last summer, I mean, seven or eight years after it originally appeared, and within a week it had been, it had been shared 67,000 times. I don't know by what process or, or how or who, but anyway, there it was. And so it drew a lot of new commentary, one of which was from somebody who said, this article is prefrontal lobe BS. He said, uh, <laughs> there's no way that those early experiences are programmed in the child's brain. If that were the, ca you know, if that were the case, then the last three generations to lead the world, including the, the boomers and the post-boomers and the Generation X, would all be screwed up and have psychological problems. <laughs> and I thought I had rest my case. 